Welcome to Surviving Society. Since the 7th of October, that horrific day and the horrors that followed, Ella and I have been in continual conversation. What started as a series of direct messages about the meaning and implications for Palestinians and Jews, including ourselves, and the political landscape in the UK, with neither of the major parties calling for a ceasefire, and our university campuses where we work and worried about academic freedom and four staff and students protesting, led to a series of actions and activities. These included a teach-in, the formation of CISP, Sociologists in Solidarity with Palestinians, publications, projects, and podcasts with colleagues and friends, new and old, as well as appealing to our institution and professional association. Through these, we tried to make sense of it all, express solidarity, and hopefully make a difference. In this Surviving Society podcast, co-badged with the Identities podcast, we want to reflect on what has occurred in Gaza and globally, our experiences in terms of our identities and work, and bring some of these issues together, as well as reiterate the urgency of this. I'm Aaron Winter. I'm a senior lecturer in sociology at Lancaster University. I'm a co-editor of the journal Identities, and my work is on racism and the far right. My name's Ella Sarie. I'm also a senior lecturer in sociology at Lancaster University, uh, and I'm on the editorial board of Identities. My work uh, centres on migration, particularly looking at the experiences of uh, young people migrating to the UK. And I've also worked with young people in in the US as well. More recently, uh, my work has explored the experiences of young migrant activists and student anti-racist activists in universities in the UK. As with many things, I'm never really sure where to start. So I thought the first place is on 7th of October. It's, I mean, it's been 10 months now, so I can't remember if we actually messaged on that day or a few days after. But the feeling, particularly retrospectively, I think of it as a kind of intake of breath that was then held for, for several days, perhaps you know, several weeks actually, sort of waiting to see, anticipating the responses, some of the responses that would come, but waiting to see what, what our, you know, how our universities were going to react, how uh, more broadly political parties were going to respond. And it felt, as I said, it felt like I was sort of holding my breath for some time because October the 7th wasn't the start. We're entering in on, I don't know, chapter five, chapter six of the story. And we anticipate responses based on the history in Palestine, the history in, in Gaza specifically. We, we know what's happened already and we can anticipate um, what the responses might be. What was it like for you, Aaron? It was a, a, a held breath, um, for sure. And a, a great deal of, of horror and worry I was horrified at the violence and a political discourse and response that started immediately. I was barely able to to react to those that day and what had occurred until the sort of the ideas about thoughts about revenge and the demands to condemn started. I expressed concern and sympathy, and I worried immediately about the response. That led to somewhat of a backlash, partly because what I felt pressure from certain quarters uh, was to basically condemn and support Israel's actions. And these were completely conflated. The sympathy with the victims condemning Hamas and supporting Israel were, were completely conflated and it it was treated as if an act that had come out of nowhere saying that doesn't mean there was context so it was justified what it means is that that it had a history it had a history that went well beyond before that day and we've seen we've seen sort of violence and the responses that it leads to and it's almost always increased more violence i was hoping but not very confident that there would be a ceasefire soon or some sort of reflection on how do we get out of this? How do we stop this? Particularly because what I, what I noticed a few days later was 
condemnations of Hamas from Zionists, support for Israel unconditionally, criticism of those who were critical of Zionism and critical of Israel's support, but also just proclamations about peace and wanting peace. Peace was was one in which, and we, we've seen this before, why don't the Palestinians want peace? And you saw this as if I felt that I was often in that position of saying like, no, I don't want peace because I want a ceasefire. It's that immediate. And part of my, you know, I often have these hesitations and pauses before I can even speak because you're already falling into this pre-scripted response. It has this, effectively for me, I find it, it has a kind of a silencing effect. I'm already aware that I'm not, you know, I'm responding in an already written script that whatever whatever I say is interpreted through through the lens that you've just described there. That immediate, of course, you feel, even now, you feel the horror of what happened to so many people on that day. But it's really hard to articulate a response to that because it's certainly as a Palestinian, you're immediately put into the, you must condemn before you can actually describe your reaction and it's a yeah it has a a way of really filtering down what it is what it is possible to articulate in that moment or what you feel it's possible to articulate in that moment and I always find the way I talk about it becomes slower on you know with the way I talk about Palestine is I'm always slow hesitant thinking carefully about what I say, (laughs) thinking about how it's going to be interpreted, thinking of the script that I'm falling into, trying to avoid the traps of that script, the the traps that you just, you know, we want peace. Well, why don't you want peace? Because, but peace in that way is, is already framed as peace on, on Zionist terms. There is, there is no justice in that, in that peace. No, absolutely not. It, it, it treats Everything that occurs that is against Israel, even a, even a support for a ceasefire is, a, is constructed as that, mm-hmm. as, as not recognizing the, the righteousness of Israel, as well as, you know, often accused of, of being anti-Semitic. I like the idea of the script because I feel often that um, I am quite slow to to say things. And I, I sometimes go through several iterations, partly because I, I, it's not that I necessarily don't want to get caught out, but I also want to do respect to the situation and those at the sharpest end of it. Um, and I don't want, I don't want it to be, I don't want what I say to become something that is used to delegitimize my argument or a wider argument about ceasefire, about genocide, about occupation, about Zionism and about Palestinian liberation and human rights. I find, though, that with social media, what I've always experienced talking about this, and I, I, I've, I've, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I'm, I'm Jewish and I grew up in a non-Zionist family, but around Zionists. And I... I have often got a sort of tightening in my chest that going, I'm going to say this, but I think I know the, the, the number of things that are going to come at my, come my way, the number of responses, and I'm going to have to respond to them and it's going to, it's going to spiral, but it's not really a discussion where either of us is going to change our minds. And I find with social media, you have that, you, you, you post something, you say something, you have to hold your breath not knowing what's going to happen or knowing what's going to happen and not knowing how many times it's going to happen. And I think the amount of things I've been called and accused of, I found very, very hard to take at the very beginning. Never thinking that I was sort of like, you know, the worst off in this situation. It took a while to adapt to it. So having a, having a psychological effect, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm still back and forth or whether I think social media is the place in which you stake your claim and, express your principles, um, not just because of that, but also because I'm, I'm acutely aware of all the people who are saying, why has no one said something? Why hasn't someone said something? But they're just not seeing it. Maybe, maybe they're not seeing it on social media. And sometimes I feel 
a bit foolish for saying so much on social media. It's also a way of coping. The, yeah, social media, knowing that, yeah, what you're saying is, so you're not just expressing your your thought, you're also being monitored in that way. Have you said something on this particular issue? And I think I've been guilty of, of that, partly because this is kind of the, it, I mean, certainly over the last 10 months, this has been the litmus test. What, you know, you every every aspect of what you're going through, I wonder where where they sit on this this issue. And I suppose social media is one of the, it's a very easy way to see, you know, how somebody, have they said something on social media? Okay, well, well now I know. Um, but of course, so many people doing things and saying things and acting all sorts of other ways off social media that, that you know, perhaps are not reflected in the, in the way that they, they, they talk online. But I think I've certainly been cautious when I've, yeah, when I've not seen people sort of loudly condemning genocide. So I think I've probably been guilty of that. I'm not, I've not been trolling them, I have to say. I've not been trolling them. I've just, yeah, you're kind of, am I safe to talk about this around this person? Do I trust them? Hmm. Interesting. I, I wanted to ask you to sort of to unpack or say a little bit more about um, what you started with about feeling worried about academic freedom and your role as an academic. But um, maybe we should before that, we should say a little bit more about our identities because because feeling uncomfortable or feeling safe um, is it's unequally distributed, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, depending on what your identity is and the wider kind of system of of you know racism and the history of colonialism. So I'm I'm British Palestinian. My dad was Palestinian. Um, he was born uh, in pre forty eight Palestine. Uh, he became a refugee when he was two years old, and he grew up in uh, a refugee camp in southern Lebanon before later as an adult moving moving to Britain. In my academic work, I don't work on Palestine, but my research with refugees is always, you know, it's, I suppose it's, it always has that connection to my, to my family's history in, in that, in that sense. Um, and I think sometimes part of my hesitation is that, you know, I'm not so used to talking about pa- Palestine in, in, in an academic context. But yes, yeah, certainly in terms of that, you know, the impact on, well, how I'm feeling now, as well as in that, those those first few months, it's, I think, you know, we've seen so many, now 10 months in, we've seen so many, you know, academic debates and university events and, and so on and, and so forth on this. There is something about those first few days when you're waiting to see what people are going to say, where you're thinking about it, living with it, every moment of that day where it's not something that is a kind of a hypothetical question of social inequality, social justice, you know, a sociological kind of abstract academic debate. It's something that that is about you, your family, who you are, and knowing that it's, it's very obviously not that for the people. It's, 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 yeah, I've really struggled with, navigating that in in university spaces there's a part of my history that's linked to this but it's not my it's not my personal experience uh and it's not my research area but i'm jewish i'm secular jewish not religious my my family were immigrants refugees to canada some escaping uh anti-semitism in in russia a number escaping prior to the holocaust and many dying in it or being murdered in it, and some survivors, including I grew up with grandparents who were survivors. It has had a profound impact on me. But that profound impact is one in which makes me an anti-racist, an anti-fascist, uh, anti-nationalist. It troubles me and really bewilders me how someone could take that experience or that memory. And I say that experience because some people have had the experience. Some people appropriate that memory or that story to um, justify nationalism, militarism, apartheid, genocide, whether they want to call it that or not, which they don't. 
or they can't see it. They're refusing to see it uh, more accurately. Even though I don't w- haven't worked on it, although I've taught on this for many years, my my work on far the far right racism and and fascism is directly informed by that experience. And I remember acutely when I was a teenager becoming politicized in respect to this, two th- two very sort of strong memories, one which I learned about the Japanese internment in Canada as well as the US. And I was just horrified and I saw my family in that. And then when I was a teenager, there was a huge skinhead sort of revival in, in Toronto. And I remember coming sort of like face-to-face people with swastikas all over them. This informed my politics, my opposition to these things, but also my research. So to speak out on Israel and Palestine does come naturally, although I have found it difficult. And it's not not only an issue of sort of, you know, expertise, um, particularly because this of the Hasbara tradition is one of throwing out facts after facts that are sort of like, you know, state approved and state justifying. So when you, you're battered by facts. Do you want to then, maybe say what Hasbara means? Well, um, yeah, no, that's the thing. Yeah, it's, yes, okay. um, it's sort of the... Uh, the public representation of Israel and Zionism. Mm -hmm. It's, it's where you see people being educated in and repeating certain truisms about it or posting, for example, sort of propaganda that occurs to support Israel and to oppose say BDS boycott divestment sanctions or support Israeli incursions or military actions, and um, it, you see it in various forms. One is like, one argument could be, and I've received this many times, well, what, what, what would you suggest they do? Or, you know, do you condemn Hamas? Um, others are saying that, you know, Israel has, you know, invented this technology or that technology. How could you boycott them? You would lose out on that. And it was, I, I hear this all the time. I mean, one of the things I, I grew up with partly was the uh, were quotes from Golda Meir, for example, or statements about, you know, ironically, an unoccupied land. And these kind of truisms, which, I mean, friends of mine and family, like, believe mm-hmm. and keep on repeating as if there's not a sort of a, you know, a historical record. You know, you, you learn these sort of things in sort of like summer camp. I, I learned them in Hebrew school. You can be pummeled by facts, numbers, and the debunking of, of, of facts. It's very hard because it's sort of like a, it's an everyday propaganda operation. So, yeah, I was um, sort of used to this. So one of the reasons I I felt uncomfortable speaking out on it was because I was I was going to be forced into this kind of Hasbro discussion where I was not going, there, was, there wasn't going to be a way out. I had to concede or I was going to become a hell self-hating Jew mm-hmm. or worse. And I've been called much worse recently. And it wasn't a fear of a lack of knowledge. Um, it reminds me sort of the, the discussion, why I mentioned social media earlier was I feel like sometimes you open up a discussion, it's not going to end, you're not going to win it. And it's going to keep on going for no reason. And if you're going to try to beat everyone in an argument, it, one by one, it's going to take forever and it's, it's, not a, it's not a way of doing politics or doing activism. Um, but the other reason I, um, I really sort of shied away from it was partly because I am not Zionist. I never have been. My, my immediate family had, did not have an identification with Israel, even though my father lived there for a short period when they, were, when they left Germany after the war. I didn't want to have to speak on behalf of something which was doing something in my name, but I didn't consent to. And I also didn't want to be called upon or asked questions going, as a Jewish person, what do you think? And I frequently felt like that, I mean, in my longer past, but also much more recently. And I've had a resistance to saying, as a Jew, (laughs) which is quite a sort of like almost a cliche now um, to mock as well. I didn't want to have to do that, but I think something radically changed. I know it changed in me since October 7th, 
that it is inescapable that it is being done in our names with our family histories and that if you do even speak out slightly you get labeled a self-hating jew an anti-semite um and that and that i i wanted to protect the integrity i wanted to oppose what was going on vocally but i also wanted to protect the 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 reality of anti-semitism and i wanted to protect the reality of a diversity of jewish voices and i wanted to protect the distinction between judaism and zionism anti-zionism and anti-semitism i think there's a sort of a reluctance perhaps from both of us to to um to speak well we're not claiming to be experts yeah in in israel palestine um but i think similarly i would i'm always you know, particularly conscious to not be that kind of token Palestinian voice of like now the Palestinian has spoken, and I think I think particularly in in um, the context. I mean, we we'll probably come on to this later, but in in UK sociologists, I mean, at the beginning actually, I was when we were thinking about the interventions of our discipline, I was thinking trying to think of other UK you know case sociologists who are also Palestinian or have. Yeah, Palestinian background, and it was, it was quite hard. Um, but also, and this bit will vary, de- depend, you know, which universities people are at. But um, it's quite, I'll say, it's quite a small presence. You feel that I think what prompted me to be more well, the, the obviously the horrors is what of what's been happening, but put, to take a more active role in this and to speak I suppose as a Palestinian with Palestinians in this in this context um was a sense that yet again uh people and this is in the university spaces we're seeing this as as a kind of a an international issue apart from Britain away from Britain and particularly when we think in terms of our union politics often I mean we saw this with with to some extent in, in very different ways with Ukraine that you know this is you know international why, why are we bothering with this forgetting that we're an internationalist union but also then specifically with Palestine and Israel forgetting Britain's pivotal role in that history and again it's it's that constant frustration of we're always starting somewhere in the middle of the story as if it's day one with losing that historical perspective um but also you're also losing sense you know there's that historical perspective but but also who's in our universities so the the idea that oh well why would we bother about something you know why should our unions bother about something that is you know happening over there and nothing to do with worker conditions here well there are us you know staff students who have Palestinian heritage who are impacted in all sorts of different ways by what's what's happening. There has to be some kind of um, engagement and, and dialogue on this. It can't be something that's that's so sort of separated in in that sense. I think that's what what prompted me. But already with a sense of wariness. So you spoke of Hasper and kind of almost like knowing what the responses are going to be. You know, we know the gaslighting that happens. We know that you know we're used to the denial. It's and it's in that context. It's not that. I'm speaking to or particularly expecting anyone that has committed Zionist views to to change. That's not, you know, that's not who I'm seeking to engage with because it's an it's a never ending conversation that goes in in circles and we don't there's no end goal in sight there. But I think it is important to speak. It's 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 everyone else. It's everybody else that's that's going to be misled. Who who perhaps we need to address. Um, but the, the Hasbro thing, I just I thought the endless conversations, I, I was in one once um, where I was at a, uh, a family and friend gathering of my parents' generation. And I um, I was asked about my politics and someone said to me, he goes, well, if, if you think what's going on in Israel is colonialism, would you, because I, I lived in Britain at this time, is, would you, and my parents were in Canada, I guess, would you, if Indigenous Canadians came and asked for your parents' house, would you give it to them? And I was like, 
well, first of all, you're assuming I'm like, I'm only against colonialism and white settler colonialism in some context that like, I've got this, I've got this odd thing where I'm like against Israel, but like totally fine with Canada. Um, but the other thing is, is that like, that I own my parents' house. And I'm the one answering the door and giving it away. It just seemed like, and the person who said this to me, we seemed quite proud that they'd come up with the winning argument. Um, and so that it's those kind of endless conversations, but and, and and part of the reason I tell that to you, tell say that is because it like as a sort of anecdote, it's I've always I've never been able to get that out of my head, but it's also about that inter- internationalism, Britain, colonialism, and sort of I guess the the international. Coming back to the university, I think what you said is really interesting because the idea that this is an international, you know, um, conflict, and I'm doing air quotes here, um, you know. Uh, which is a way of neutralizing, which I always find it interesting because there's a, a construction of equivalence that goes on. At the same time, the focus seems to be on defending Israel and having the onus being to prove that Israel did something wrong and then rejecting that. Mm-hmm. So Israel's actions and history are, are not acknowledged. A conflict is, so it's equivalent, but is it an asymmetrical kind of position that most institutions in position and and institutions of power take, but the the idea is that we're in a university, and I'm I'm partly raising this also to get to CISP as well. The, um, you know, a university is an yes, it occurs in a local community. It is a national institution, regional institution. Um, it's also an international institution. I was going to say we're all in global university. We are, and I don't. I'm think a world they, leading global university. One hundred percent, and they don't necessarily not want to talk about the international when they're talking about recruitment and finances, mm-hmm. or when they're talking about developing research and financial relations and contracts with global corporations, which get involved in international affairs. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's like, you know, don't talk about that. It's happening there, but it's on campus. Like, it just seems really odd. But the the other thing is that I, 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 so I think that's really important, but it's also important because not only do the students come from across the world, but so too do the staff. And the staff often um, share identities with or come from countries and contexts that are involved in horrors, tragedies, the staff and students need support from the university. What what strikes me the most and why I also felt the need to speak out is because I was constant as a as a Jew, scary, 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 uh, as a Jew is because I kept on being told I must be fearful that we must listen to Jewish voices, but no one was listening to mine when I said, I'm not fearful. (laughs) And when I wanted to know if they were listening to Palestinian voices or Muslim voices on campus, particularly considering the way in we were, they were talking about pro-Palestinian solidarity as linked to extremism and terrorism. And this is international as well as national, as well as institutional. It's about decolonizing and it's about EDI, which seem to be sort of points of priority in institutions. This is what, and I won't say surprise me, I tend to be, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, tend to be somewhat cynical on this. Um, But I, I suppose being used to being in those conversations, which already, I mean, with some, some degree of, doubts, cynicalism, I guess, um, those conversations about decoloniality, about EDI, which are so central now to in university agendas, but also, you know, responses of in universities to um, people seeking sanctuary in Britain. So, for example, have been, you know, involved in, yeah, in res- responses to kind of around funding of, of places, uh, scholarships, sorry, for, for, for students. I think it's, it's having been regularly for some time involved in those conversations and then thinking, well, you know, by its, by its logic, you would think that 
a kind of an appropriate response to what's happening to Palestinians now would be, you know, to see that through that, you know, if they a claim is made that, the, that this university is committed to decolonizing. Well, in almost, you know, when you said as, uh, in that anecdote from your childhood, as if sort of somehow nothing at all has been said about coloniality in other contexts, but it's, well, it's the exception where it's talked about, you know, it's actually in, you know, the converse of that, really. We talk about coloniality a lot in all sorts of other contexts, um, not necessarily following through with with material actions, but but it's it is debated, and yet suddenly there is a silence um, when it comes to when it comes to Israel. That it's you you know how would you, you're not going to see this through a through a decolonial lens. Somehow this is the exception. Um, or you know if we're talking about scholarships, yes, we can you know we must talk about scholarships for Ukrainian students, but Suddenly, if we talk about that for Palestinian students from Gaza, that becomes much more complex. Complex always being the word. It's always complicated. Uh, and it's always a conflict. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and that's, that's yeah, the two complex and conflict being the two words that are probably most often used in, in, in university statements <laughs> in response to this. I like the alliteration. I was I was thinking of is a conflict or conflict and complex. So let's come together and do nothing. I think that's pretty much what follows, right? Yeah, it's a, um, it's a kind of a holding statement of this is too. We we recognise that we need to look like we're doing something. We need to respond in some way, but our response is this kind of holding statement which we hold indefinitely about how complex and co- this conflict is <laughs> so that we don't, you know, we just, yeah. So we don't take any, any meaningful action really. Absolutely. And I mean, I think we've, uh, yeah, I, we've seen that quite a bit. I was thinking also as, as sociologists, um, the, the complexity issue <laughs> and, uh, how com- how complex it is, um, because I think when when we start first started discussing this, one of the things that we we spoke about is the role of sociology and our obligation as sociologists, and that doesn't mean you know so- sociologists need to be heard from in on principle, but but also the fact that our students come from a wide variety of backgrounds, they're concerned about international issues, they're concerned about power, they're concerned about racism, discrimination um and violence and inequality um and we i think we also one of the things we discussed was it was a lack of statements at the time from sociological associations and bodies yeah and one of the i think these are they're overlapping but they're two separate issues one is is the idea that you know sociology for example we teach this we research related themes. And that doesn't mean sort of like everything, you know, you, you force it into our subject matter and our teaching. But like, I mean, you know, I teach about like, you know, racism and the far right and the far right were sort of marching on the cenotaph against the National March for Palestine. Right. Um, and so I, I sort of had to say something um, in my class. But but that sociology itself is a study of power and inequality. And it's, you know, I was thinking of this as someone who, whose background is social theory. I mean, the core, the, 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 the cornerstone of social theory is sort of like the post-Holocaust experience theorization and analysis mm-hmm. from the Frankfurt School to Bauman. And it's interesting how little that matters mm-hmm. when sociology is is called upon to speak. Absolutely. I mean, and also, yeah, I mean, as it's, you know, as it's art, that is, sociology is about centering a critical analysis of power and inequality. So we, we can do complex, we can do complex and we can talk. So yeah, let's, let's unpack that. That's, that's our mission, as it were, as sociologists, we, this is yeah. something that we can do. 
Um, and it's very, yeah, it's very interesting what you said about, um, about the Holocaust and Frankfurt School. and the, Because I think also, I think sometimes we're, you know, of course that comes into, you know, if we're uh, looking at race and racism and migration and colonial things, we, you know, we, we think that Palestine fits in those conversations, but it's also just more broadly within the core of, if, you know, sociology modules, surely, in, in social theory, inequality. Um, and I suppose that's what, you know, sometimes I think it's, you know, where there has been a response, it often is unsurprisingly in th- those areas of sociology, but then the, it feels like so much of the discipline kind of goes untouched. Nothing is Nothing is said. Absolutely. And I think one of the reasons I said about the Holocaust is is because genocide and imperialism and, um, you know, racist violence is at the very core of our understanding of modernity. And it's not as if sociology is going, yeah, but it only applies to anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. They're saying we don't want to touch this. We don't want to apply this here. We will apply Bauman to anything, but we will not apply it here. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, it, it's it's interesting because when, you know, they'll apply theory to anything, but not here. And then we're also seeing a, a discipline that is really, really going after impact, right? We need to speak about, about this. We need to get, tell people what sociologists think what they what what we can contribute to the policy debates and to the world events and world of understanding of world affairs like political science does mm-hmm. i'm not saying political science is progressive on this it's absolutely not but um he, you know, but we don't want impact here <laughs> it's, it, it, it's really it's really interesting and i i've i mean do you want to say a little bit about cisp and your experiences and yeah yeah. yeah, so I think that, I mean, so cis, cis oh, it's a little bit tricky to say, so sociologists in solidarity with Palestinians. Um, so this was a collective that was formed, I think our, our first statement was in November, but we were formed towards the end of October, and it was um, me and you, Aaron, and uh, a few other, a small number of other sociologists um people don't don't mean, just mind being described as sociologists um who were in touch and it was these similar conversations it was those first few weeks when we're kind of waiting to see right what are our universities going to say what are our professional bodies going to say what you know what sort of yeah waiting waiting for those statements that, that never came we thought well we we need to say something here we need to speak in some collective way about um, about what interventions sociology can make at this time. Um, we want to do more. We had already, of course, been speaking as individuals, being acting as individuals, acting with, you know, within our unions and so on. But we wanted to speak in a collective way as sociologists to to say some of the things that we've already spoken about about the cent- you know what is the central mission of sociology and why does that matter in terms of um sociologists speaking and acting now at this moment and so we set out to we we did our initial statement um which we, you can find online on our website about what sociology is and does but also we wanted it to be more than than a statement kind of that sits in a bookmark somewhere we wanted to commit to a set of actions so one of the things that we did was start to develop a teaching curriculum for the reasons that we've you know we said already about the need to kind of mainstream teaching on, on Palestine within sociology putting together a set of resources that people can use we also we've started a um, a webinar series. Um, we've already had a couple of sessions so far around um, decolonizing and teaching, um, and around Palestine and global solidarities. Um, we held a, a Palestine reading group for students, and this was um, this was in that that period of time before the encampment started. So when we were aware that students, as you said, there are a lot of students who are 
impacted in all sorts of ways by what's been been happening. Um, but the lack of uh, spaces on, on on campus to have those discussions, the the silence from their institutions, and in some cases, you know, from on their courses, meant that a lot a lot of students were feeling very isolated. We had the Palestine Reading Group online to to try to reach some of those students. So this is our this is what we've been doing so far, and we kind of carry on. We kind of evolve a little bit as as we go along. It's you know as as we we pass through different moments of this this horrific genocide we we evolve in terms of what what we see as the priorities at that moment it's been a long time of holding your breath mm-hmm. and we're in a we're in a place now um where it's still going on mm-hmm. we got more sort of terrible news the other day about a school yeah being attacked what do you think sort of the i guess the the work of CISP and the work sort of you're doing and we're doing, where do you think it, it's situated or, or the sort of the, the impact of it will be? I mean, I don't know we'll have to talk about impact, but I think our, our aim is, is that in some way we make, whether, well, I don't know whether that's big or small, make some sort of inroads into em- embedding these sorts of discussions within the mainstream of what we do as sociologists this isn't just a moment that is is passing by obviously it's you know the most horrific time in in the, you know, in the history of Palestine really it's a, it, it's one of the most horrific times but it is this didn't come out of nowhere um so I think it's partly in, in, embedding that that critique within within what we do as sociologists both in our kind of research etc but also in the, in in our curriculums and it's making sure i think you know it gets hard as a time goes on um 10 months in i think this is the fear that a lot of people have that it's of, of course it already has slipped off you know slipped down news agendas there's less discussion online other things you know it gets overtaken by newer stories but it's still ongoing and I think it's just making sure to to hold that that space in within our discipline um, for these issues but also I think what you know we're always have in this moment we're, you know, we're speaking to our discipline but we're also speaking to within our universities as well yeah um, and I think that's you know most most recently the exhaustion of it. So in, if we think you know in our our, mem- our membership is is quite varied, but you know we, we include people who are, who are Palestinians, people who are not Palestinians, people from different racialized backgrounds, you know, and including people who are are, are from Gaza as well or have family and and friends there people who've been in, impacted by the the responses um censoring speech on on palestine so particularly other you know muslim and, and arab colleagues as well um and i think that's it you know we want that that's that space to be held to recognize that actually you know, to, to continue to interrupt, really, and to say that it's important to interrupt, that we cannot, well, this was a moment and now we get back to publishing our four-star ref articles and getting our research going. Because, we may, you know, that's not, how, how can you do that? For many people, it's that, it, a lot of people, it, it they're living and breathing this. Um, it's impacting every aspect of their daily life. The support within our institutions is inadequate. I think if we put this in our second statement, sort of six sessions of cognitive behavioural therapy is not gonna yeah. it's not gonna do it. <laughs> um, in a context of this university that you know, this such a depoliticized response to it as if it's something that's, you know, an individually traumatic experience that can be respond you know, dealt with in that in that sort of way. It's not at all. Earlier, you said you were cynical, and I was just gonna—I was just gonna uh, note that you were quite optimistic about the the ref returns. 
<laughs> of course, yeah. Um, now the uh, and, and actually my and, and, four star referable article. Yeah. <laughs> other people's other people might have one in the. Oh no, I meant in general. I meant in general. But it was. It was also. I re- it made me realize that I used the word impact, and that's not what I meant. I think it's just how well I'm trained. <laughs> <laughs> um in higher education these days yeah the the depoliticized response what you just said got me thinking and it's it's a question that i sort of i i, I keep on thinking i'm going to come around to but i i've sort of to abandon all structure i kind of want to ask about it. it's totally depoliticized and what i've seen is the reduction of this issue not to even geopolitics not just geopolitics, but actually like Jewish Muslim relations or Jewish Palestinian and Muslim relations. Mm -hmm. One of the ways in which I found both kind of curious, really frustrating is the way in which sort of we came together to talk about this as, you know, a Jewish person and a a Palestinian Mm -hmm. is having to convince people that we would get along. Yes that we weren't in conflict. Mm -hmm. And I had someone say to me going, well, if you can get along, then why can't there be peace in the Middle East? I'm like, I don't even know where to start with that. Because it's all about interpersonal friendships. That's where it starts. I would say, actually, I I always do this. I I make a statement and then immediately contradict myself. So I would say it's it's very depoliticized in that kind of psychological, you know, individualized psychological responses, but also so highly politicized, as we talked about, that it's so politicized that it's not possible to have, you know, it's not possible to have a a meaningful response. It has to be something that we have to put on the shelf to, you know, to look at later because we we can't deal with that at the moment. Um, We can't possibly interrogate that. So is, is that kind of, there's nothing in, you know, it's, and at both ends, it diffuses any kind of meaningful action. It's either so politicised that we, we can't possibly say or do anything on this without offending somebody. Um, but at the same time, we recognise the deep impact it has on particular individuals. And this, and it's very interesting that we've come around in this loop that I think we have this, we both have this kind of slight awkwardness of, centering our our identities in that way in this because well because as sociologists as well we recognize that it mm. it isn't down to those interpersonal relationships and muslims and jews or israelis and palestinians getting along but so often it seems to come back to that in the solutions presented yeah and i th- i do i do think you're right that it has something to do being sociologists as well as being you're called upon to do something or people are careful around you because of your identity. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you may be forced to say something or influence to, or, you know, you know, nudge to, or whatever you you want to use to say something because of you, not just because of your identity, but because of the position you're playing in someone else's chess game. Mm -hmm. That, and I say someone else is not because I'm talking about um, the actual genocide or, um, but I'm, I'm also talking about people's attempt to analyze it in ways in which they, I guess, project something onto you and position you in it. Mm-hmm. And I've, I, I, one of the reasons I didn't want to, I didn't want to say anything and I think the first thing I, I I said about this online was actually just like a sort of, it was, it was almost like it was just a impulse. Mm-hmm. Like I just, I go, I, I need to say something. I'm really scared. Because you're being told who you are in relation to something, why we have to be careful around you and why you have to hate someone else. The, the, the self becomes a way, I mean, you have to reclaim it back mm-hmm. a bit. And that's also because you're you're not just political pieces in this. Mm-hmm. You're also we're also coming at it from a history of racialized subject positions. I find it for me the reason I want to talk about my Judaism or my Jewish identity from an anti-essentialist position, one in which I'm being told I'm afraid or I might not be really Jewish. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> or or that when I when I have discussions with people, they talk about Palestinians in ways that I find, you know, I find imagined. Mm-hmm. In, in both racist and in sort of like liberal narrative terms, mm-hmm. right? And so it's it, it's about telling people who you are so they can't do that for you and you can speak for yourself and your political principles. Mm-hmm. But also, I mean, tied in for this for me is an analysis of, of race and identity or racism mm-hmm. and identity. And that, that's a racism, a historical racism that... Um, I feel really, really important to kind of to speak out on because the way in which, you know, you have you, know, you have non-Jewish people telling Jewish people that they're not proper Jews because they don't support Christian version of Zionism. You know, it's it's that you know someone needs to speak back. Mm-hmm. And and it is awkward. It is awkward because centering the self always feels wrong. And I feel I feel that doubly because centering a Jewish perspective in what's going on does feel very wrong and awkwardly (laughs) thank you for doing that you know despite being jewish is always an awkward thing to hear (laughs) someone messages you about yeah that's an interesting comment how did you escape hasbro (laughs) i think partly i mean we spoke a bit about our um academic specialisms and what what we focus on i think partly for me it's also about being consistent it's you know being if we consistently, you know, we talk about research work on, you know, anti-racism, racism anti and anti-racism on um, migration, refugees, or, you know, talk about decoloniality. It, it has to be, we don't, can't suddenly just stop at this point, again, because it feels a little bit awkward, because now it's, you know, we, it's like self-consciousness of centering ourselves and the awkwardness of that I think it's it's also about being consistent in what we've been doing all along in our in our research and teaching and careers as sociologists we've been talking about racism and anti-racism we've been talking about um refugees we've been talking about um colonialism so to suddenly stop would be in a sense feel even more weird but I think it's also important to situate that and while not flattening out this you know the specific circumstances in in you know in different contexts that we're talking about to kind of reflect back that continuity rather between these these contexts um to reflect back that hypocrisy of saying accept for Palestine in the, in these conversations, um, it feels particularly important to do that at the moment, and I think that's where I would I would come in. It's 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 not kind of claiming any particular, um, you know, academic uh, specialisms on on Palestine, but but to say that we can't not speak about Palestine if we're going to be having these other conversations. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, I think this is also part of the disappointment with sociology. Um, Big disappointment. And yeah. Yeah. As it dis- yeah. And um, w- picking up on the issue of racism, which I do, again, it's tied to identity, but it's also where we work. Anti-Palestinian racism is, is a term um drawn up by Abu Laban and Bakan in that article, Anti-Palestinian Racism and Racial Gaslighting. So they talk about a specific form of racism against Palestinians. So in that in their article, they note some of the kind of overlaps between anti-Palestinian racism, anti-Arab racism, Islamophobia. Um, and they talk about what is what is the kind of specifically identifiable anti-Palestinian racism and kind of what that entails. And it was, you know, sometimes when you read an article, you're like, oh, that's what it is. That's what I've always known and been able to, you know, I've known that that's what's going on. But sometimes sometimes just having a someone set that out for you is, is, is incredibly helpful. Um, so kind of at its, at its core is that, denial 
Um, so they used, you know, the key example of the, the denial of the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948. But, you know, it's that constant denial, that constant denial that, you know, there's, for example, that, you know, you mentioned about um, anecdotes from your childhood, but I, you know, remember often hearing, um, and if, there's no such thing as Palestinians, no, Palestinians don't exist, this kind of constant, who was there first, um, this didn't happen, that didn't happen, wasn't as you described, that constant denial, which with the, as you know, they say comes this this form of um, what they, um, they, they refer to as, as racial gaslighting, so kind of making you almost doubt your own sanity that, you know, you'd have, have you believe that, you know, Israel and Palestine are, you know, Israel and Palestine are these equivalences in power, um, that it's about that kind of, as we you know, as you said, a kind of a peace between two equal conflicting parties. So that's at its, its core. And then this kind of third element as well is is this victim blaming. So um, I mean, this get loops us right back around to the beginning. So already you're kind of, you know, we see this constantly, Palestinians, you know, being described as this, as, or presented as, as terrorists, of having, you know, brought this on themselves. So even, you know, a, a school can be bombed and 100 people killed. But actually, you know, if we, if we look at what our foreign secretary says, that, that yes, you know, Israel maybe shouldn't be doing that, but also maybe, you know, it's the fault of, of Hamas fighters hiding behind civilians. And it's interesting how, you know, in those contexts, Palestinians can never truly be civilians. They're always, there's all, you know, they're never truly civilians in the way that Israelis are always civilians, even though they have conscription into the IDF. Yeah. You know? um, but, you know, and I'm not saying that there are not, obviously I'm not saying that there are not Israeli civilians, of course there are. But it's, you know, that you're constantly me blamed. Well, this is very tragic, but... We, you know, we have to kill all these tiny children because, because you know, Hamas is using them as human shields. Um, and then when you try to protest, um, but, you know, Palestinians, why are you, why are you so anti-Semitic? Coming back to that beginning, you sort of feel, and it, ha- it has a truly psychological effect, you, that sort of silencing, that second guessing, that, well, what words can I go to now to describe what it is that is happening, anticipating these sorts of responses. But at this point, 10 months into a genocide, I start to care a bit less about that because we know the responses that are coming, but this is what is happening. It's interesting because we're going back to that issue about um, sort of it's about Jews and Muslims, which I've kept on hearing about. There is absolutely no doubt Islamophobia plays a role in this. Palestinian Muslims are a significant pop- population. When the, the the conflict, to use that sort of euphemism, is that I I notice Palestinians being the word Palestinian being taken out of the situation. There's an erasure that occurs in that construction, mm-hmm. and it's very convenient I find, particularly in what I'm seeing in sort of the North American kind of Zionist movement to make it all about Islam. Mm -hmm. And that is because of Islamophobia, Mm -hmm. because it creates this idea of an eternal battle Mm -hmm. between two faiths um, and two sort of like, you know, trans historical, you know, you know, um, Mm -hmm. peoples, but also it allows for the, the removal of Palestinians as people and a population within this occupation, colonialism and genocide, such that um, you can deny also, you can deny their right, but you can also deny anti-Palestinian racism as a thing. Yeah. The people who make this argument can also obviously deny Islamophobia exists, but they, they are, the argument about Islamophobia not existing is different than the one about anti-Palestinian racism not existing because anti-Palestinian racism doesn't exist because Palestinians don't exist to them. Muslims still exist. They hate them 
and they accuse them of all sorts of horrific things. Mm-hmm. And in, in Canada, in Ontario, there's a big uh, discussion going on about anti-Palestinian racism becoming part of the law. Mm-hmm. And this goes to sort of um, experiences of high school students in Ontario mm-hmm. uh, being accused of being terrorists or, you know, mm-hmm. um, and the the treatment of Palestinians in the education system and in parliament. Um, and the response I've seen online is, this is, you know, this is, they're not a race. They're not a people. Mm-hmm. What about anti-Semitism? Mm-hmm. And it becomes this sort of back and forth um, construction of a, you know, who exists and who counts. It's interesting because that the, the same people will tell you that Islamophobia can't be real because it's not a fear and it's not about, that's not a form of racism. Yeah, because it's about religion. No. Religion and ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, when you call it anti-Muslim you need racism. You be able to freely debate ideas. Yeah. 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 Which fits perfectly with the reactionary culture or free speech argument, which is why it's so dangerous and toxic. But then they want to claim anti-Semitism is a real form of racism, but doesn't get any recognition within anti-racist discourses. This is the whole, you know, Jews don't count argument. Yeah. But when you ask them to define anti-Semitism, they link it to Zionism, to anti-Zionism. Yeah. So it's about ideas. Okay, the idea of a state, the idea of, you know, and so it, it becomes it becomes quite interesting as someone who occupies one of these positions, but also someone who works on racism Mm -hmm. and actually believes that racisms are interconnected, that, that the idea that you should separate them Mm -hmm. is not to say they're not different in different historical periods, in different forms, in different relations to power, but that the idea of, of separating them, is also part and parcel of the divide and rule that says it's us, it's you versus you. Yeah. And you have to go to separate corners of the sort of the, you know, the boxing ring. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and you're only one side's going to get attention. Mm-hmm. And it's, you see this really, really like, um, seriously in the, uh, the IHRA definition that, that uh, many universities have accepted, there is not an equivalent for anti-Palestinian racism, anti-Black racism, anti-Muslim racism. Yeah. And I, you know, so for, for all the ideas that there's a, it's depoliticizing, going back to what you said before about being a conflict mm-hmm. and it's so highly politicized. I'm wondering really if it's so highly politicized, it has to be euphemized and flattened out mm-hmm. because there is a fear of offending Jewish people. Now, this is not about offending Jewish people. I think there's also a fear of it's always been being presented as such a complicated conflict. You couldn't possibly know enough about this conflict to comment in an informed way. I think there's... So, and I think that's also probably why sometimes... There's a reach for kind of perhaps more familiar language of this is about uh, well this is about anti-Semitism and this is about Islamophobia this is a conflict between religions this is um just is uh, just about I don't know, just about land you know that kind of reducible yeah. aspect of it yeah and and when I say about offending Jews I don't mean all Jews no. I mean the idea of Jewish people. I, I, because I don't think anyone's worried about offending me um, <laughs> in this context. I don't think they're worried. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, but the, um, the idea being is that I think it's a very, very just like I think the, the philo-Semitism, the pseudo-support for Jews only in the service of Israel or Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism in that it conflates Jews and Zionism, but it actually treats Jews as foreign. Mm -hmm. And it also only supports a strong sort of like militaristic form of Jews. Whereas Jews like me 
suffer abuse because we don't subscribe to that by the same people who, or, or, or in the negation of our existence and identities. Um, and I say people like us, like, I'm not talking about just me. I'm like, uh, there are many of us, we get erased, we get negated as Jews because we don't support this imagined idea of, of a Jewish person, which I would argue is a product of European guilt over the Holocaust and not just guilt, but political interest in the region that has to do with colonialism, which was part and parcel of the creation of Israel too. And, but that I think this has become worse in the past number of years, which is partly feeds into how devastating and horrific this lack of of intervention over what is happening to Gazans and Palestinians is because this had been so central to British politics. The idea is that if, if a party doesn't support Israel, they're anti-Semitic, they've got an anti-Semitism problem. And this has created a situation where the two leading parties, and we're coming on the back of an election, which plays yeah. a significant role in where we are. The, the, the Labour Party ha- feels like it has to support Israel to not be anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. And it has yeah. led to such abuse, uh, such horror and violence and death, but it's also led to huge abuse by those who stand up to it, internal to labor as well. And I think disproportionately Jewish and Muslim and black labor members and MPs. So, so picking up Aaron, from what you said about that kind of um, militaristic uh, representation of Jewish identity today in, in that conflation between Zionism and, and, and Judaism that's presented in that in the kind of forms of support for Israel and also the fact you know the both I say both major political parties here but also in the US um, yes. so, you know making that support for Israel central in 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 the in the platform and policy making. I mean, it's just looking at it kind of as a, I wouldn't say as a casual observer here, but just, you know, watching this from, it, it's quite extraordinary. It's just the obvious anti-Semitism in that, the, the, I mean, I, and I think, I think I remember seeing you commenting on this on that line, actually, the kind of, the really horrific uh, and disrespectful depictions of, of, um, Jewish people who were, you know, murdered in the Holocaust are somehow being, you know, we're not these weak, and I'm using inverted commas here, you know, we're not these speech minds, we're not weak Jews again. But this idea that that's, that this kind of aspect of, of Jew, this, that Zionism is not, you know, presented as sort of central pillar of Judaism, but sort of reified to such an extent that it attacks other aspects of of, of Judaism. It's, it seems most peculiar watching this from the outside and most peculiar how it's not called out you you see this also in the i mean i i've been i've been quite shocked i mean I, i've been i've seen this the idea of like we're not weak anymore you know i mean as you say like i mean like i don't know what they're saying about my grandparents and my great-grandparents and my uh i mean the people that like me and my brother are named after you know the mm-hmm. children you know it's just it's just shocking but the I think this is very much linked to the play between the the strong and the weak in racialized representation Absolutely. and deployments. Jews have to be strong to be acceptable. Muslims are represented as threatening mm-hmm. and subservient at the same. You know, there's a, there's a gender construct, mm-hmm. um, and they they do, they they do this all the time in racial in race, racist mm-hmm. representations. But you also see linked to this is the idea that Hamas, and by connection, Palestinians, because they're all implicated, are worse than the Nazis, because at least the Nazis had, and the, the, the you know, had, a, they were ashamed, they were conscious, they were like, you know, they felt guilty, whatever, right? Whatever they want to say. Um, and it, it gives a humanity to the, not only to the Nazis, but it gives a, a, a humanity to white Europeans. Mm-hmm. And so the brutality of Hamas is, and the, is the brutality of, of the Muslim, of 
the Arab in the the Palestinian in the racist imagination um, that actually lets Nazis off the hook. And it's not in connected to what do you see what Germany's doing now, mm-hmm. the crackdowns. And it's, it's, it really exposes the coloniality and the racism of this, mm-hmm. but also the way in which racialized groups are play things for racists and imperialists and, and I think that I think that's also why the talking about the self and the the positioning you're in and coming out of or trying to challenge really matters. Mm-hmm. I think that's also been um, some of the beauty of protests against genocide, the making visible some of the links between between these different contexts. Um, I know at one of our events we had um, the ethnographer, the filmmaker. Manal Masalha, who presented some of her work on the protest on the protests, and she showed beautiful clips and quotes from different people making that you know doing that analysis, making that link between coloniality in in these different contexts and and the way that that logic is is being presented. I think you're also seeing. I mean, these kind of protests. I mean, really bringing people together. Mm-hmm. Um, they they are represented so badly by our institutions, by by governments, by the media, and I mean everything from sort of the uh, the marches in 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 cities across the world uh, to campus encampments, mm-hmm. um, real places of solidarity and and love and and support, and. Um, it's, you sound very optimistic, I remember some of the sort of yeah, I mean it's it's also interesting looking at the the crackdown on that, the kind of the real concern about what that the power of that could be. Yeah. Um, abs- I think it's absolutely key. I think it's fear of this. Um and I uh, I was I was, I wrote something a little while ago about, about it. I did some, some posting about it, about my experiences um, at one of the marches with my children um, and the absolute vile hate I got. And it was telling me that like, like I mean, like <laughs> I kept on hearing that like my life was constantly under threat. And I think I've told this story. I might've told it to you before, but I only had one kind of like weird, awkward moment where I was, um, I was taking a picture of a banner and um, I think this is like, like an example of my age and my, <laughs> um, I was walking backwards because like, you know, you don't, yeah. I just, Who did you just, you just <laughs> yeah, I, I, my, my, my son was laughing at me, but I was walking backwards and uh, taking a picture of a banner and uh, this woman holding the banner was saying to you, you should watch out. I say, why should you might back into someone? You might step on someone, and just like a child. And I turn around and I said, "Oh, they're my kids." She goes to me, "It's still wrong." (laughs) (laughs) I was like, "In case you didn't know," and I yeah, I wasn't even embarrassed because it was like it just it was like just so like nice, Mm -hmm. and it was like um, it was worried about the kids. You know, mm-hmm. and you even saw like, you know, the the moment, and I, I'm saying this also as someone who works on the far right, you know, the far right show up on the Armistice Day mat- march mm-hmm. and wreak havoc. You know, the fact that people are still thinking this is where the danger lies, this is where the extremism lies, yeah. is absolutely shocking to me. Mm-hmm. And that I guess my hope and optimism, which is slightly uncharacteristic. <laughs> so I was right. surprised, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I don't think it necessarily like follows out that I'm optimistic and hopeful about power. <laughs> I am about people, including what we've seen over the past number of weeks. You said before about like, about th- things moving, you know, they're going on, they're terrible, but also events are occurring that are pushing this off the front pages yeah and, and that's something i think is really important to sort of like the work we do mm-hmm. is to keep it there 
I, don't, I mean, we collectively. Yeah. Um, but uh, we've seen one of the things that threw it off the front pages was these far right riots mm-hmm. and these far right pogroms yes. that are occurring uh, throughout uh, England and, and more widely. And it's it's like how they're not seeing this linked up this these are the same people that are aligned with the government around issues of immigration mm-hmm. islam and israel all presented as legitimate concerns yes yes legitimate concerns absolutely um that legitimate concerns people have got a bit carried away because we never talk about immigration um and <laughs> to uh, we never give, people are never given platforms to express their their racism um and so this is the only way that people can do it yeah. I, um, the the statement the other day about like you know we were afraid labor is afraid to talk about immigration mm-hmm. i've been thinking about that a lot in terms of labor's really, really um, cracking down on people who criticize Israel. Mm-hmm. Making people afraid to criticize Israel, because somewhere in that, I think labor has bought into that idea that you have to be afraid to talk about things, yet constantly talk about them. Yeah. As long as you're on the right side of them, you're still, you're talking. And legislating, you know, <laughs> and either acting or not acting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that's... Um, I think that's partly a sort of like a quite reactionary and dangerous framing to be afraid to do something, particularly when it's untrue. Yeah, there's a point to me. It's somewhere about governance through fear. Those who are governing pretend to be afraid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of the, always the sort of, but it's not the actual things that we should be afraid of that are, you know, causing danger and harm and so on it's these con- yeah constructed fears i think when you're talking about a genocide going on and the response to people calling it out is an authoritarian crackdown on protest mm-hmm. and the unleashing of fascist far-right vigilantes tells you all i think all you need to know about where we are right now mm-hmm. because these are intimately connected mm-hmm. The reactionary backlash, the sort of the the sort of the um, backlash, the reactionary context we're in, the mainstreaming of the far right, it is where we are politically. And just because they're on the streets, they're there because they've been mainstreamed and emboldened, not because they're protesting the government. It's, it's a good thing about who has a, who has a platform to yeah. to speak and and what becomes no. I mean, apart from thing. It falling off the news agenda is with more and more people murdered in this in this genocide. There become fewer and fewer people um, there in in Gaza speaking, you know, be able to portray what's happening and and with the capacity to do so. So, I think that always has to be central to what to what we do is, you know, I've I've just noticed though how quickly and I think. I think I'm, this really struck me when when the student encampment started in the US, but how quickly it's that balance between, you know, recognising the connections and ties between what is happening here, what's happening in the US and what's happening in Gaza, but not decentering that in our debates, which we very, very quickly do. So it very, very quickly becomes about... You know what's happening to students in our universities. What's happening within our own political debates here in this country? What's and, it, uh, and so quickly removed from what's actually happening to people who are being genocided now. What they think, what you know, what what their experiences are, what they see as any future way out of this. And it very com- quickly comes back to you know what should Palestinians be thinking and doing and how what would you know what in what was the what actions are needed from them to to make 
peace possible, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I just, I, the, the, I, I don't have any answers, but I just feel that whatever is the next step has to be come from what people in Gaza think is the next step or should be the next step. It can't come from outside of that. That's a really interesting point. And I think a good place to end the discussion. Thank you for listening to Surviving Society. To support our work, you can rate, review and subscribe to host or produce a series of Surviving Society. Get in touch with us via Twitter or Instagram.